uh, we're ready to get started with today's session, Secure Development on the Salesforce Platform Part 2. My name is Li Han Huang. I'm a web application security engineer here at Salesforce on the product security team. I work with internal teams to work with uh, our software. I do some research on the side, some tools development, and uh, I also do app exchange reviews. So, um, I'm Vinay. I work for the product security team as a product security engineer. Same as Lihan, I have internal teams with anything related to security and also do some app exchange security review. I also work as a developer, uh, developing some internal tools using the Salesforce platform. So if you notice, this is part two of our webinar. If you missed part one or would like to review, you can check it out on our YouTube channel, on the Salesforce Developers YouTube channel. We also have the slides and code from part one up. So you can look at what we've done in part one for our application and get a quick overview of it. So today we'll be talking about mainly visual force issues that you may encounter when you're developing on our platform. Uh, we'll talk about general security practices and just good development practices and what to do when you're developing visual force in Apex code. Before we get into the content, just a quick legal statement. Uh, do not make any purchase or investment decisions on our talk today. We're not talking about anything new, but uh, just don't make any purchase decisions on this talk. Go social. Please follow us on our uh, social network channels. We have Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Again, this is being recorded. You can check out the recording right after. We'll try to post it up quickly. Have questions? Uh, don't wait till the end to ask. Uh, we have someone helping us uh, put down the questions and we'll try to answer them as soon as possible. Uh, please don't repeat the questions. We're working our way down the queue. There could be a lot by the end. So stick around for a live Q&A. We'll try to answer more questions at the end, time allowing. And if there's something that's not been answered by the end of this webinar, feel free to head to the Salesforce developer forums where we have Salesforce experts and other developers like you checking out content and help answering questions. So today, we'll start with an overview of our sample app, which is a continuation of what we developed from part one. We have a lot of new features, and these new features come with new vulnerabilities that we'll cover. Those vulnerabilities are cross-site scripting, which we'll go over first. We'll go over reflected, store, DOM, the three types of cross-site scripting, how to approach your problem, and how to fix them. Next up, we have open redirect vulnerabilities, and lastly, cross-site request forgery. So uh, let's take a look at the app that we are doing. Uh, we are we are using for demonstrating the vulnerabilities. This is a single Visual Force page app. That means there's just one Visual Force page in the whole app. Uh, this Visual Force page has a search for accounts. So if you search for any term in accounts, it's going to grab the account name and get all the accounts for that particular text you have entered. Uh, it's going to also display relevant information such as revenue and description and also display opportunities. We also have a functionality where uh, the zip uh, and the address is taken and we get the four zip of that particular zip code. Right now, we just a placeholder. It's just a dummy function. But in the future webinars, we are going to make an API call and fetch the four zip. We are adding some new features to this app. Uh, which also introduces new vulnerabilities. So these features will demonstrate how uh, how, how, how a normal Salesforce developer might code and how what's the best practice need, needs to be followed in order to fix the vulnerabilities. Now let's take a look at the new features. So this is the app. This is the Visual Force page. Uh, I, if I open the Visual Force page, it shows a search box. The some new feature we've added is you can search using the URL. So if you give search, equals test, it's going to search for test in account name and return all the accounts with the search test. Or you can search for uni, which is going to search for all the accounts with the letter uni and return all everything. Uh, some, the other feature we have added is delete functionality. So you can delete on a click for the corresponding opportunity. You can also update the opportunity name using a click. And we also can open the zip code in Maps, and it'll open up in Google Maps. 
Now, Lee Han will talk about cross-site scripting. So what is cross-site scripting? It's one of the most common, if not the most common, web vulnerabilities today. It's a web vulnerability when an attacker can insert unauthorized JavaScript into the web page view by other users. So in order for cross-site scripting to happen, user input has to be displayed on the page. And another requirement is that there is a poor separation between user input, so which is should, should be data, and code. And this is usually due to improper sanitization on user input. What does that mean? We'll go over it later, uh, but let's take a look at an easy example. So let's say we have a search engine called www or at www.coolsearch.com. Uh, the search page is slash search, and you put in your search query in the query parameter. So when you search for, let's say, cookies, you'll see the resulting page that shows all the cookie results or the search results for cookie and also a text that says you are searching for cookies. So this is just a good UI design. So the user, when they're searching for stuff, they know what they're searching for. It's bolded on top of the page and you know what you're looking for. Inspecting the source code for you are searching for cookies, you see that it is embedded inside in that header one uh, HTML block. And a malicious user or someone that is uh, well-versed in web development will notice that hey, the user input cookie is now reflected onto the page. So what happens if you try to put in other text that's not a uh, simple alphanumeric and could be interpreted as control character by the browser? Let's say, for example, script text. So uh, let's see with this attacker enters uh, cookies, script, bad JavaScript, and, and script tag into the search query. Now, when you look at the result page, you still see you are searching for cookies. So you take a look at the code and see what's going on, and you realize the script tags are there, but it's not rendered, or you don't see it on the browser because it's rendered as correct JavaScript blocks. You don't see the JavaScript blocks on your web page. However, a valid JavaScript within the block that you entered still executes. So in this case, if bot JavaScript was an actual JavaScript and does something to your browser, it will execute in the context of this page and this domain. There, are, like we mentioned earlier, there are three types of XSS. First, there is reflected. It's the most simple, like the example that we just went over. Malicious input is sent to the server and reflected back to the user in the response. Usually, this is a one-step process. You put in your user input, you put in your XSS payload in the request, and immediately the browser or the server takes the input and reflects it back onto the page. Next is also stored slash persistent XSS. This is when the input is permanently stored on the server and reflected back to the user. Uh, usually that means that the user input is stored in the database somewhere and retrieved either immediately. So let's say when you register an account, it will show you a welcome page with your username or your first name and last name. That's reflected right away. However, it's still stored and persistent because it's stored somewhere in the back end in the database. And later, you can come back to the same page, and you'll still see your user input. You don't need to put it back into the um, request. So uh, another example would just be forum posts or on social media. Uh, I mentioned already first name, last name, um, your comments, things like that are stored persistently. It's also an attack vector for XSS. Lastly, there is DOM, document object model, which is malicious user input reflected back to the user without ever reaching the server. This requires DOM manipulation by JavaScript, and it's a little bit more difficult to find. So what this means is that a server is never uh, involved in this case of XSS. So some kind of JavaScript on the page takes the user input and immediately writes it back onto the HTML page. Uh, it's very similar to reflect XSS, but it requires JavaScript, uh, a little bit dif more difficult to find. We'll give an example later on, which makes, should be make, makes it a little bit easier to understand. Moving on to cross-site scripting on the sole source platform. So when you're developing uh, Visual Force and Apex pages, we have built-in autoencoding, provided that the user input don't occur inside a style or script tag, or user inputs don't occur in, within an Apex tag, with the escape equals false attribute. So what that means is that when you're using standard page layouts, uh, input and outputs are not vulnerable because they're auto-encoded. 
And if you're just using simple merge fields or you're taking user input from somewhere and putting it inside uh, Apex tags as just plain HTML, they will be auto-encoded. You don't need to worry about uh, cross-site scripting on your application. We also provide native encoding functions in cases where that you do need to use your user input in non-HTML context. And even though we have built-in encoding functions and auto-encoding, it doesn't mean that your application is always safe from cross-site scripting. Let's take a look at some Visual Force examples. So first, we have safe uh, HTML auto-encoded uh, cases. So in both of these, we're using a merge field, it's doing current page parameters on name, is taking the value of the name parameter in the current page and putting it back onto the page. In both cases, you're inside HTML space, which means that your user input is shown as plain HTML. Uh, using Apex tags, Apex tag output text without the escape equals false attribute, Visual Force will render this as uh, just plain HTML, so whatever you put in there will show up on page as just data. Inside divs, same situation. This will be auto encoded here. However, if you choose to do escape equals false for any reason, say you need to do need to show HTML for uh, the purpose of the page, you do need to do escape. Uh, you have to escape the user input manually because in this case, let's say you have a open and close tags. This will be, it will be shown as control characters and not encoded properly and the browser will interpret it as proper HTML code. Next up, we have your user input or the user input inside script variables, inside JavaScript. So this is also unsafe because it's inside script, or if you just change the script to style tags, same case. Uh, special characters inside JavaScript and CSS are not auto-encoded, so you need to do some, provide some encoding yourself. Lastly, we have unsafe multiple parsing contexts. So in this case, even though your user input is technically inside of HTML, it is also inside of a JavaScript handler inside the HTML tag. So this is what we mean by multiple parsing context. When the browser encounters this, this is going to parse the HTML uh, tag first, then it's going to encounter JavaScript and parse JavaScript. When, you're, when browser is doing multiple parsing context, you need to ensure that you do the proper order of encoding. Uh, fortunately, we provide an encoding function that would make this very simple. So now that we know uh, what XSS are, uh, what to do when that happens, let's take a look at the example in our application. Um, this example, we're going to be, uh, XSS is going to happen in a escape equals false attribute and it picks up the text. So like we mentioned, we added a functionality where you can search uh, with the URL parameter search. So let's search for test. And you can see that like the search engine example, we have a little search results for thing. So what if we put some uh, HTML tag in here? Let's say we put uh, H1. So a sharp user would notice that, hey, the the text is here, that's from the URL. However, Hello World is now bolded. And that's most likely because the H1 that we inputted in the user uh, on the parameter is interpreted by the browser as proper HTML. So now we can change how the page looks. What if we want to execute JavaScript? We want to do some kind of XSS. So again, we'll put in some search query, except in this case, we're going to have proper JavaScript that does something onto the page. So simple proof of concept for cross-site scripting. We usually do alerts or prompts, something that shows it easily shows the user uh, JavaScript is getting executed. So in this case, JavaScript is executed on the page. And this is an example of reflected XSS on Visual Force. We talked about native encoding. and we can use this on reflected and stored uh, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So before we go into fixing, let's take a look at the examples. So where standard platform encoding doesn't apply, uh, we need to use the encoding functions. So those four of those cases are JavaScript context, style context, 
URL context and a combination of JavaScript and HTML. Let's take a look at the examples below. So we have Apex output text tag where escape equals false. If you need to use escape equals false, which means the user input is not escaped, you'll need to use the encoding function HTML encode. So uh, it's a provider function in visual force. It would automatically encode your user input for HTML context. For uh, script variables for JavaScript, use JS encode. So this will encode uh, JavaScript control characters such as single ticks, uh, double quotes, and then some other characters that are special control characters in JavaScript. So your user data will only be interpreted as data and not as part of the JavaScript code. Inside multiple con parsing contexts, you need to know the correct order of encoding to use. Uh, luckily, you can just use JS in HTML encode in cases where you have your user input inside of some kind of JavaScript handler inside of HTML. Lastly, if you're using URL, you can use URL encode to properly encode your user URL. So in this case, you have an anchor tag. Uh, user input is inside href. You can use a URL encode to properly encode your user input so there is no case of uh, cross site scripting. So now that we know how to approach this problem, let's take a look at how we will fix this. So we'll pull up our developer console, which has all of our uh, zip4 code. We'll take a look at where the cross site scripting is happening. So if you remember, it's current here, where it says search results for. So we can see that we're using escape equals false for this case. There's really no reason we need to have a plain HTML here, so we can just remove this. However, if you like, you can also use HTML encode, and it will encode your URL search query and display as just data. In this case, we don't need this because we're just removing escape equals false. So now that we removed it, when we take a look at our application again, it should solve the cross-site scripting issue. So we'll try the same uh, payload that we used earlier and see what happens. So now you can see that instead of rendering this as JavaScript, the browser just interpreted it as uh, text and displays it onto the page. So we took a, like, take a look at the source code. You can see that you no longer see the script tag as part of the markup, and it just displays it as text. So that solves one of our cross shifting issues. We added a bunch of functionality, but there's also, unfortunately, stored cross-site scripting. So in this case, you can execute JavaScript inside of account descriptions. So this page shows a lot of information, and what if the user wants to know what exactly dream point is? So you can take a click at the name, and it'll show the description of the account in a pop-up box. So how does that work? This works through a simple uh, inline JavaScript where we do, uh, when you click the account name, it shows the description. So show disk is a uh, custom JavaScript that we wrote for this page. And inside is just the uh, description of the account. So when you click it, it'll pop the description of the account. So we notice that the, this uh, line of text here, it's actually controlled by a user. And what that means is when you go into accounts, so this is a standard page layout, we'll see the exact same description in this description field of the account. So we're just pulling this and putting it inside our visual force page. So again, this is also user input. So what happens if we put in some control characters to try to influence how it looks like on our zip4 application? So here we have our payload. It looks a little strange, but we're just disturbing the default JavaScript uh, syntax. We're adding our own JavaScript here, 
and whatever is already there, the single tick and parentheses would start here, and it will make a correct uh, JavaScript statement. So we'll just do this, save it. Let's say a poor unsuspecting user goes to this page and accidentally clicks on an account name that has malicious JavaScript inside the description. So this still executes, so we will see the expected behavior. However, additional JavaScript executes and whatever bad things that the JavaScript decides to do will execute on the victim's browser. So how will we approach this problem? Again, we can fix it in our Visual Force page. So if you take a look at our uh, code where the show description function is executing, we have unclick show description. So if you notice, this is similar to one of the examples we gave where you can use our native encoding function because it's a JavaScript inside of a HTML context. Um, this is our oops, show description. In case you were wondering, it's just doing alerts if there's a description. So now that we know this is JavaScript in HTML, let's take this encoding function and apply it to our Visual Force page. So JS in HTML encode. We'll save this. Now let's try again and see if this still the same payload still works. Ah, so you can see now, instead of executing um, your own JavaScript code, the single take that I put in the description is now encoded. So when the browser sees it, it will just see it as text and show accordingly instead of taking it as control character and extending the JavaScript. So there we fix the reflector cross scripting problem. Lastly, we have a DOM existence vulnerability in our application too. So we decided that we want to be able to update the opportunity name in uh, on the page, so you don't have to go and click and find the opportunity and update it. We're just going to update it here. So let's see how this works. So we'll click update, and you can enter a new opportunity name. You see, when, you, when I click OK, the page doesn't refresh. So what this does, um, on the back end, this is actually doing a synchronous update to the opportunity. The opportunity is updated. We don't see the page refresh. So most likely, we are doing some kind of JavaScript update of the document object model. So let's take a look at what we can do in terms of cross-site scripting. So we're using image source equals x on error. This, this is going to error because source equals x is not a valid image. And JavaScript here will execute when the browser takes a look at this code and tries to load this image. Ah, there you go, our JavaScript executes. So this is an example of DOM XSS where the server is not involved directly and the XSS executes. So before we go into fixing this, let's take a look at some uh, prevention techniques that we can use for DOM XSS. So this applies to everywhere and not just in Visual Force. Again, sender access prevention technique applies. You want to always encode user input, so output encode, and if possible, use platform provided encoding. And you also want to avoid dangerous DOM modifications. So we'll see that in this example, we're using one of these dangerous modification methods. So those are document.innerHTML, document.outerHTML, or document.write. Instead of doing those things, you should use text content for element values. If you know, the user input should only ever be interpreted as data. Uh, using text content, um, the JavaScript will automatically encode uh, the whatever input you put inside, so it won't be parsed by the browser as part of an HTML markup. So now let's fix our DOM cross site scripting issue. So we added a functionality called up, update remote opportunity when you click the update button. 
So we put in the opportunity ID, and here is the function. So we ask for the new opportunity name, and if you, the user puts in a valid name, we'll update the page to show the new name. So here we're using uh, document got get element by IDs, which is the ID of the opportunity, and we're doing error.html. So this is the unsafe document update here. If we just remove that and update it with text content, it will fix the issue. So we'll click update again, and we'll try the same payload and see what happens. Ah. See now, when the browser sees this image tag, it doesn't interpret it as proper HTML. It will just show as text and uh, fixes the DOM cross-site scripting issue. Before we move on to the next category, I'd like to go over just some quick pra good practices for cross-site scripting. Just remember to never trust user input. You don't know what could be put inside of your application. It's even worse if it's persistent. Uh, so always assume that there could be dirty characters, like control characters that is part of the user inputs, so always do proper output encoding. If you're do, doing um, output encoding, be aware of the context. So as we saw in different contexts, be it in HTML, in href for URLs, or multiple parsing contexts, you need to know which encoding function to use in order for the browser to interpret the data correctly. So uh, if you're developing for uh, Visual Force, Use our native encoding functions. You know, HTML encode, JS encode, JSON HTML encode, and URL encode. You don't need to write your own libraries to whitelist or filter characters. These things provide a comprehensive method for encoding uh, user data to prevent cross site scripting issues. Next, our, my colleague Renee will talk about open redirect. So, what is open redirect? Um, it's when an application takes a URL from uh, the param from the URL parameter from the URL and redirects the user without doing any validation. Uh, this particular attack can be used for phishing, as well as uh, uh, loading, as, as well as malicious uh, sending malware to a user. So basically, just to give an example, let's assume Salesforce has open redirect. We do not have it, but just for uh, demonstration purposes, let's say Salesforce has open redirect. Here, what happens is uh, if the start URL is a parameter which is vulnerable for open redirect, and the start URL has a parameter called evil.com. Now, when a user goes to login.salesforce.com, he's going to see a login page as usual. He's going to type his credentials, and after he's typed his credentials, and once the user is authenticated, he's, he will be redirected to evil.com. Evil.com could be something like a phishing page, as you can see, and it can have same uh, username and password field. And you will think that, oh, maybe I entered my username and password wrong, and that's why it's showing the screen again, and you might enter the credentials again. Uh, and the evil.com page will have your credentials, and you can do whatever you can with your credentials and basically get all the data from your Salesforce off. This is bad. Uh, you might say, okay, evil.com is something that I know I can see in the URL. I will know immediately when I see it. But there are ways to make sure it's not visible. For in the second example, as you can see, the start URL, the evil.com is actually URL encoded. So when you go to the page, you won't see evil.com in your URL. You will see some encoded part. You will think it might be a token and then redirect the user. So the problem here is the application is not sanitizing the input and it's directly allowing the user to be redirected to an external site without doing any validations. So open redirects on the for Salesforce platform. Here open redirect is protected from uh, in Salesforce in almost every part of the Salesforce. For example, the redirects can be in red URL, save URL, or cancel URL. These takes only relative URLs and will not redirect you to external site. So Salesforce platform itself protects you from open redirect. But since the, uh, the application is so flexible and since the uh, developers can write their own code, 
such vulnerability can be introduced in in a visual foes or something like that. So just to make sure, uh, open redirect is where you take the URL parameter and redirect the user to the new, another page. Uh, let's let's take a quick example of how this might be introduced. Here, uh, as you can see, the Apex page is taking the URL from the URL parameter and then redirecting the user to that particular URL. Uh, so here, if you give a URL as evil.com or anything which is bad, it's directly taken from the URL and redirect the user to that particular URL, which could be bad. This flexibility is sometimes necessary, and if you can do some checks to make sure the URL parameter is correct, then it's fine, but uh, if you're not doing it, this could be a vulnerability. Let's do a quick demo in our sample application for this particular vulnerability. So I'll open my FOSA app. Uh, there is a button called Open in Maps. Basically, what this does is it takes this particular zip code, goes to Google, and opens Google Maps using the zip code. Now, uh, if you can see what's happening, let me open, get the location for it. And here it's actually redirecting the user to an Apex page called Redirect to Google. And then it's taking a parameter, which as I said, it takes a whole URL and sends the user to the particular URL. Now, instead of Google, if I put a malicious site, uh, for example purposes, let me put example.com. As you can see, the user was redirected to example.com. If example.com was malicious and it had a fake login page, and if you can just take the URL and give it to uh, anyone, and they will think that the URL is coming from Salesforce, they would trust it, and but it's going to redirect to a fake site, and the, the username and password could be compromised. Let's look at the code, uh, why this is a vulnerability. So here is the page, here is the thing, here is the href, redirect to Google, and it's taking the whole parameter as an input. Let me open up the Visual Force page and the controller for it. Here's the Visual Force page, and here is the controller. In the Visual Force page, as you can see, it has a controller which and an as a action function. In the controller, it's just redirecting user, taking the input from the URL, and then uh, taking and doing a new page reference for that particular URL. Now let's see how, to, how do we fix this one over here. So first, uh, and the easiest way to fix it is not taking the URL as a parameter. Instead, doing it hard coding in the code itself. So in our application, you can just make sure that when you click a button, it's automatically redirect to the external site without doing any intermediate redirects. But sometimes, because of business reasons, you may need intermediate redirects. Uh, for that, you can follow the next uh, recommendation. The second recommendation is to make sure you take only the relative path. So for example, you just take at home slash home slash JSP, you hard code salesforce.com before it in your code or in a setting. So as soon as a user goes, if you take home slash JSP, the, since the domain is hard coded, the user can't change the domain to something evil. Uh, just a thing to make sure, if you're doing a redirect in the same domain, for example, you're doing a redirect in the Salesforce itself, and you're not hard coding it and doing a relative redirect, Make sure you check for double slash because if you put, if the user puts double slash, the whole URL goes to an absolute URL mode, and user can put attacker.com and he's redirect to attacker.com. Uh, let's say the relative URLs is too restrictive, and you do you do need to check for domains. Here you can do that by using regular expressions. So basically, fetch the domain as a regular expression and then check if the domain matches a whitelisted set of domains. In our example, you can check if the domain matches google.com or something like that. Uh, just a thing to note here, the way the URL is constructed and domain is constructed, there could be a lot of corner cases. For example, as you can see here, uh, there's actually an at symbol in the, in the domain name. This is actually a valid domain name. If your regular expression is not doing a good job of fetching the right domain name, it can fetch salesforce.com, and which could be a valid whitelisted domain. But this URL actually redirects to attacker.com. 
which is not a whitelisted domain and the user can use such an attack to basically fool the irregular expression that you have. The lastly, uh, one, other, one other way of mitigating this is uh, instead of using redirects, use a token. For example, you can say red URL equals one. One is, you can store one as a variable inside your uh, Salesforce database as a custom setting. Say one is home at JSP. Now when the user, user goes, it's, user goes to this particular URL, the application takes one and then kind of gets the URL for that and then redirects the user. So you can store one as something, two as something, and then give this particular link to the user. This way you're protected from auto redirect. Let's fix our vulnerability. Uh, we'll be using the second approach which we discussed. So, um, so this is the page and this is the controller. I have a fix for this controller. Instead of using this, I'll be taking the UR, the, the method directly. So let me open that up. So here is a fixed version. As you can see, uh, in our Visual Force page, we are passing the domain. Instead of passing the domain in the Visual Force page, I'll be passing the domain in the controller of the particular VF page. So I will. Uh, in, so what happens is right now the red will contain only the zip code and nothing else. Everything else is hard coded. The user can't change the domain. Um, so I will change the code to reference this particular file. Remove the domain from our Visual Force page. Now let's look at if we have fixed the vulnerability. Now let me do a search, open in maps. It works as expected. Now I'll take the location and try to redirect the user to some external site. Here if I give HTTP example.com, it redirects to Google and it doesn't do a redirect. So we have fixed the one already. Next, we're going to talk about CSERF. Uh, what is CSERF? CSERF stands for Cross-Site Request Forgery. Uh, this is actually a very good feature. You might have used this. For example, let's say you're logged into Google and Google Calendar, and someone sends you a link to some invite in Google Calendar. You click on that link. Uh, since you're already logged in, the browser will attach the cookies for Google Calendar, and you're authentic authenticated automatically, and you don't need to give your username and password again, which is really good because since you're already logged in, the browser does all the stuff for you. This could be used maliciously. For example, let's say a bank has a servlet which takes two inputs, amount and two address. And uh, you, if you give amount, uh, whatever it is, and two to whoever you want to transfer, it automatically transfers such so much amount to that particular person. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are not doing any CSERF check. This could be a problem because if an Attacker takes this particular URL, attaches both the parameters amount and two, and then puts it in an image tag and puts it in his blog. If you visit his blog and you're logged into the bank, uh, the amount from your bank is automatically transferred to him, which is kind of bad. So to fix this, you need to be making sure you have certain something called a CSERF token or something that is unique that to verify the user is performing that action. Uh, these requests needs to be on the create, update, or delete actions. So here, you are, since you are doing an update to the account, you need to be attaching CSERF token. So let's talk more about the CSERF tokens. Uh, these tokens need to be associated with a particular user for the particular session, and it should not be in the cookies because the browser will automatically send the cookie uh, when you go to a particular URL. So these needs to be uh, in the DOM, or in the HTTP address. Also need to make sure that these tokens are unique per user per session. And when the user is, let's say, he logs out, the, these tokens should be invalidated. Uh, CSERF pro protection in Salesforce, basically we do make sure all the requests that goes through have CSERF protection. It could be in standard pages, such as an account page or an opportunity page, or it could be in an Apex page. We have CSERF protection everywhere. You don't need to worry about this. There's only one corner case where the CSERF 
might be introduced is when you make any state changing operations on a load of a page. So if you have a visual first page and you have action function which does some state changing operations such as the delete, update or uh, any of these operations then you might introduce CSERF. Let's take a quick look at CSERF in our demo application. So I'll open this Forzip app. Um, I'll do a search. As you can see, there is a delete button corresponding to each opportunity. When I click, click the delete button, uh, it redirects me to a visual force page and takes the parameter as an ID. So this parameter is taken in and deleted automatically on the action function. This is CSO because I can take this particular URL change the ID to whichever ID I want to in any opportunity and send to someone. When they click on this, they automatically delete that opportunity. So to show that this particular account, gene point lab generation is deleted, I'll refresh the page, do a search. You can see that you cannot see the opportunity anymore. Let's look at the code, why this is happening. So in the code, we can see that the here is a href. It's Z4 opportunity and delete ID is opportunity ID. I'll open up the page for this. This is the visual force page. It has a controller of Z4 delete opportunity and it's performing an action on the action function. Let me open up the class as well. As you can see in the constructor, it's getting the variable delete ID and then doing a query to opportunity and getting the opportunity. And on the call of a function, which is on the action function, it goes ahead and deletes the opportunity. We have a CRUD FLS checks in place as we discussed in the previous webinar. Even then, since the delete is happening automatically, it's kind of bad. So what's the fix? Uh, for fixing CSERF in Salesforce, you need to make sure you're not performing any state changing operation on an action function. It could be on a visual force page or it could be lightning using the do init function. So if you do not perform these actions on the page load, you are kind of safe from CSERF. Uh, so to perform such actions, it should be in a command button. So you need to pass a command button with the uh, with the particular action you want to perform and you, the user needs to click on yes, I confirm it That way it's protected from CSERF. So let's go and fix our vulnerability using this knowledge So I'll open up another page that I've created which has the fix As you can see here in the, the vulnerable page It's performing the action in the action function, but here we have moved it to the command button action now it's going to load the page and it's going to wait for the user to click on the delete button to delete the particular opportunity. Uh, I'll take this visual force page and add it to my uh, main force app. Okay, so let's test out our fix. I'll reload the page, search for an account. Now I'll try to delete uh, this particular opportunity. When I click on delete, as you can see, it's not deleting on page load. Instead, it's waiting for the user to confirm this action. Uh, when you click on confirm, the opportunity gets deleted. So, uh, you, someone, if, you, if, you, if, if someone provides this link for this opportunity with the particular ID, it's not automatically deleted. The user has to confirm that action and then only it gets deleted. Okay, so in summary, what we spoke about today. Um, for cross-site scripting, there are three types of cross-site scripting. We have the reflected cross-site scripting, the stored cross-site scripting, and the DOM-based cross-site scripting. Um, to fix the vulnerability, we should always sanitize the output, um, which is coming from the user. It could be from a URL or could be from a database. Uh, when you're sanitizing, you should also make sure which context you're in. Let's say you're in HTML context, you should do HTML and code. If you're in JavaScript context, you should do JavaScript and code. Uh, for the open redirect, uh, to fix the open redirect, you need to check if the user, uh, you're validating the URL you're getting from the URL parameter. 
and then redirect to the user. For CSERF, do not perform any state changing operation on load of a page. Uh, th that way, if you want to perform an action, you need to put in a command button instead of on an action function in the Visual Force page. These are some of the references that we have. For XSS, you can go to this particular link. It gives more information about it. And for Open Data, I can see stuff as well. We also have a security forum where you can ask questions, or if someone asks questions, you can answer their questions related to any of these topics. This is a brief survey um, that you uh, that we encourage you to take. Uh, just note that this survey will help us in future webinars to make sure how do you want the content and everything. And also do note that this particular URL is case sensitive, so S and D uh, needs to be in capital, capital letters. Um, yeah, let's look at some questions now. Uh, and also we are on Twitter, we have Salesforce devs, uh, for Salesforce developers, for security, we have secure cloud devs, so please follow us, and if you have any questions, you can ask there as well. Okay, the first question. Okay, what are the tools used to test XSS? Um, this is currently um, more of a manual process, but we do have a tool called check marks that you can use, where you can scan your code for XSS. It's gonna give you an output telling which other code, which particular line of code might be vulnerable. But it won't cover all the cases. Some of the phases, for example, DOM-based XSS might not be covered. That you have to do manual testing uh, in order to find any XSS. Some questions? Yeah. Um, next question. Uh, XSS protection for Lightning. So uh, Lightning is a client-side framework, so it's very similar to DOM XSS. You want to use uh, the same protection and same precautions that you would take for pre preventing DOM XSS. So don't use the dangerous methods. Make sure you use text content. Uh, there are additional requirements. If you're publishing Lightning components or Lightning applications on uh, the App Exchange platform, there are additional requirements that we listed on the ISV guide. Basically, covers XSS protection. We don't allow um, DOM modification outside of uh, rendering. Um, some of the additional uh, requirements that we have that basically covers cross site scripting is it's not just for cross site scripting protection, but mostly for uh, separating um, customers JavaScript from the rest of the DOM. Uh, so there's a question about redirect. Uh, could it be mitigated when it is required to go to other websites like account name or website? So when you're doing any redirect, just to make sure, you need to do a whitelist approach. So you need to check the domain and it needs to be whitelisted. And from there, you can make sure that if the domain is in the whitelist, then allow the redirect to happen. But don't take arbiter, don't take the use, user input directly from the URL and then redirect the user. So whenever possible, do do whitelist approach that might solve your problem. And we also discuss some other solutions which might help you. Uh, someone mentioned that we didn't have code from part one of the talk. But uh, we will provide code for part two, which is we continue the application from part one. So when we release the recording, the slides and the code for part two will contain the codes for part one as well. I think that's all the questions. OK. Thank you for attending. Uh, as, as I told, as we told in the beginning, this session will be recorded and sent. So you will be able to ask, access all the content of this webinar and also the recording. Uh, we'll also post the sample code for this uh, that we have developed so you can test it out yourselves. Uh, please do subscribe for the next webinars that we have. Uh, we will send you reminders for that as well. Thank you. Thank you.